tonight on The Breakdown. Bodhi's off to Japan, but you'll never believe who helped broker the deal. Dave Rennie zooms in as Super Rugby Australia ignites and the team opens the floor for some heavy debate around the global game. Kia ora, hello and welcome to The Breakdown. Yes, tonight it is game on. We are looking at the games, the contest, the future of rugby and maybe the direction of player contracting here in New Zealand. But I tell you what, it's game on this weekend. It's what JK wanted. He was desperate to have and he's going to get it. You've got the Crusaders. You're both undefeated now. Super Rugby. Oh, here we go. He's got, he's, he's got the blue side oh, shoes. Oh. I'm going to be bringing them down. Yep. To Christchurch. <laughs> and I tell you what, Crusaders fans are going to be ready for him, Mills. Without any doubt, all the things he's talked about, they still remember when you played for Auckland with the hoops, coming down there and stealing the Ranfilly Shield from him in 1986, Mills. They'll be gunning for him. Oh, absolutely. And now that he's put his shoes up like that and showing them out, they'll be thinking, what the heck is this? What's yeah, they're doing coming down like no, that? No, no, I tell you what. I tell you what, they'll be more worried about how good the Blues are going, Mills. Did, so you didn't oh, watch? Did you didn't watch the Crusaders in Dunedin? The Blues were perfect last weekend. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I did not think that the the Highlanders' score reflected the game. I thought no. they were put under a lot of pressure. A couple of moments that the Highlanders didn't take, and even the, your poor Chiefs, Milsey. Like, if you don't take those moments, those opportunities, you don't get another one. It's like Test Match Rugby. Well, that's how, that's the beauty of this whole Super Rugby Aotearoa. You just don't know sort of who's going to get right from the beginning, who's going to win. But the moments, they are crucial. You can only play spoiler now. That's the way the Chiefs are looking at it. You know, look, it's been difficult for them. They'll know they'll rebound. They'll take their week off. But, Bernie, are you going to be able to recover? Are you over it? I've got earplugs and I can't hear you. I'm just going to do some talking tonight. You're so cruel, so cruel. Um, if there is an optimum time to renegotiate your contract, it's when you're in blistering hot form, isn't it? So you'd imagine Hoskins Satutu was in the box seat when he was sitting around the table with the Blues re-signing for another two years. The inform number eight, he'll be a regular fixture with the Auckland franchise, as will Mark Talia, the winger, also having a stellar season, and he's recommitted to the Blues until 2022 too. Well, the hits, they just keep coming with the fallout of coronavirus continuing to eat away at unions globally. That's at all levels too. The RFU is culling almost a quarter of its staff, announcing 139 jobs will go. Now, the RFU's bottom line has really suffered, unable to host internationals with no certainty on just when crowds will be able to return. They're projecting that their recovery period will take five years. Still in the UK, he defied the odds and recovered from a very serious spinal injury in January while playing for Worcester. But former Hurricane Michael Fatialofa is said to be trading one hell for another. He's being hit with a staggering six-figure medical bill after his four-month stint in hospital. Three of those in private care as there were no beds in the public sector. Despite now being off contract, Worcester has vowed to shoulder the cost to cover it no matter what. Their fundraiser, it's already raised $80,000. Sands our boss, Andy Marinos, he's optimistic the rugby championship will happen. He suggested the back end of October through to December as a likely window for the test matches and that the Eastern Seaboard of Australia was the logical option for venues, of course. One big problem. No rugby in South Africa, no rugby in Argentina yet, and they've only just restarted in Aussie, haven't they? Now, how gutted will the Chiefs be after their loss to the Canes at the weekend? And exactly where that penalty by Geordie's big hoof was taken from? Neil Barnes, he sums it up pretty well, I think. Oh, we've got to hang in there and keep going. Oh, that was an even match, and it's been really, really physical. Um, there was only seven points in it right up to that point. Um, so good on the Hurricanes for taking it. Pretty shitty with that last penalty. That was incurred 10 metres back and the people upstairs should be pretty filthy of themselves. OK, we'll leave it at that, mate. Thank you. Oh, that is awesome. Tell us what you really think, Neil. He's got a point, though. He may have a point here. I'll tell you what, though, the, the beauty of it when you've got that half-time interview, you're never sure what you're going to get, Bernie, but Mills, that is the perfect result. You go in there, one question, and Neil Barnes, he summed it up. I think, though, JK... He had every right to be disappointed and frustrated, particularly just before half-time. You talk about momentum. When someone kicks a goal from 60 metres, it can have an impact on the game. But the, the footage doesn't lie, right? One answer, mate. Captain's challenge. They're doing it in their area. There should be a captain's challenge. Finishes all that stuff. Sam Kane's blowing up on the field during the game when they get penalised, right? So if you have a look at it here, he said, yeah, offside was fine. But then... Moves how far forward you can count it. <laughs> yep. 
That's a big miss, Mills. This 15 is 15 metres? Miss, really. oh, it's, and it's huge. And we, we spoke about it earlier, Jeff. The fact that your mindset then, if it was back there, would he have really had a shot? behind that 10 metre, and, uh, I don't think he would have. You know, well, he would have gone at the half time. I, I think the big difference for me is when he was kicking from that distance right there, even though he went well over the bar and, and went uh, dead, you still got to believe you can get it over. He believed he could get that one Hang on, over. we're getting off the subject. What? It was a great kick. It was a great kick. Unbelievable but kick. But he, he knew still he could get got it from, from that distance. Back. No, he wouldn't. But the problem well, he is... may have. The problem is, how can you resolve that? Barnsley's right. Yep. And if we had a captain's challenge, that wouldn't happen because Sam Kane would have stopped the game and said, take it back, have a look. And it's all over, and the game changes, Mills. Yeah, but isn't it what Barnsley meant? He's got guys upstairs, and the ARs, surely they would have said to him, that, that, that's not the mark. They're not allowed to. They're only allowed to intervene for foul play, aren't they? Question, so unless they get asked. Oh, well, as, well, the news, as I just understand out of that it. News, out of that news as well, though, Andy Marinos talking about JK. The possibility, what is he talking about? I, 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 what is he talking about? We talked about this last week. Why in the world are we preparing to play a tournament in Andy, Australia? Andy, listen, Why? over here. Safest country in the world. Safest country in the world. It has to be here. Well, 40, 14 days, without Thelma and Louise, obviously. <laughs> 14 days, and then you can play. We're the safest country in the world. Why is he even thinking about another country? I don't get. I do not get it. Does he not watch the news? But the way I'm looking at it, Mills, I, I, there's no logical way. I mean, you think about what you're trying to achieve and what, what you're trying to get out of a tournament, and we're in a position here in New Zealand where teams are playing. They're going to get an opportunity to prepare. We could find bases for sides to have that two weeks of quarantine. We did it in the rugby league in yeah. Australia, protect themselves. But we've got crowds right yeah, now, exactly. guaranteed crowds. We're ready to go. So I don't understand why he's still even thinking about having it in Australia, they've closed their own borders off to each other. So I think, you know, it, it seems we're the, the, the only option really available. So why not start working on that so we can get some international rugby going? Well, someone who wants to get some international rugby is Dave Rennie. He is the new coach of the Wallabies. He is joining us all the way from Palmerston North. Renz, you've come back from the UK. It's great to see you, mate. A uh, couple of weeks in quarantine, I assume. Where were you? And I asked the same last week. Were you tested? Uh, yep, you know, we were, um, I'm in Palmy now, but we were at Ridges and uh, in Auckland and uh, you got tested, tested once and uh, all clear. We've, we've had three months of lockdown in Scotland, a couple in uh, Auckland, great to be back in Palmy. At home for a couple of weeks, when do you head back to Australia? When are you based back over there? Um, yeah, we're going to head away in a couple of weeks, there's obviously a few immigration things to sort out. Um, with uh, not being an Aussie passport holder and so on. So, um, but yeah, it looks like we may have to quarantine again, which is exciting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Dave, interesting start. You obviously got signed by Raylene and then obviously, unfortunately, she's not there anymore. I mean, was there any moment where you were thinking maybe this is not going to happen? Oh, look, I mean, I've, I've mentioned this a few times. Um, look, she's, she's a big part of the reason I signed. A really impressive woman. Um, but, you know, I, I'd committed. I'd already signed. Um, we've made a lot of other appointments uh, based on that. And, um, and so, look, you know, we're in boots and all now. We've, we've been doing a lot of work and uh, looking forward to the challenge. Renz, there's always talk about uh, the challenges you have over there, particularly with you know, the NRL, also the AFL and things like that, and also your player pool and the talent. Have you, have you got the depth over there, or have you got some hiding in quarantine with you that you're about to take over, mate? <laughs> We've, um, yeah, look, it's competitive. Um, you know, uh, rugby's the fourth most popular sport. Um, uh, there's real competition for the best kids leaving school uh, from... You know, NRL and AFL and so on. So, um, like it's an area of a union's putting a lot of time into trying to establish relationships with the top kids to try and keep them in our game. So, um, yeah, like I say, there's a number of challenges, but there's some really good kids coming through. Why did you, Renz, feel as though this was the right time for you to take this opportunity up? And what, what are your, what's your reflection or your understanding of the Australian game? Uh, the fact you've coached against it um, at a number of uh, levels. Uh, what convinces you the fact that this is the opportunity you're looking for? Yeah, I like timing's everything, I guess. Um, you know, I first spoke to Raylene and Jono, you know, about a year ago or a lot more than a year ago. And... Gave me plenty of time to do my homework. Um, lots of good people 
Um, we've just got to try to get everyone pulling in the same direction. And um, so, look, I've, I've really enjoyed it so far. I've spent a lot of time remotely on uh, on Zoom calls like we're doing now, uh, talking to players and, and doing a lot of planning with our management. And fortunately, got a couple of guys on the grass, um, Matt Taylor and um, Scott Wisemantle, who are outstanding coaches and are driving the connection with um, the Super Rugby clubs. And I'm trying to do that remotely. So... Not ideal, but um, you know, hopefully I'll uh, I'll get three week or three months on the grass before we um, start playing against the All Blacks. Renj, you've uh, coached in Super Rugby. You've coached overseas now. I mean, have you been thinking about what a possible Super Rugby tournament looked like moving forward? I mean, is it fundamental for you to have New Zealand in it? Can you see it a New Zealand Aussie deal going forward? What would you like to see? So I lost a little bit of it. Were you talking about Super Rugby, were you? Yeah, what the future might look like. Um, you know, there's talk of South Africa going north. Um, obviously, you've seen Super Rugby Aotearoa, outstanding. I mean, is it fundamental for you to be part of Super Rugby with New Zealand in it? I think it's, it's vital for Australian rugby. Um, you know, to be playing week in, week out against the best. And, you know... Um, well, uh, I guess over the last few years, it's been um, not have a lot of positive results. But if you look this year, the Brumbies rolled the um, the Chiefs. Uh, Rebels beat the Highlanders. The Reds should have beaten um, the Crusaders. Outscored them in tries and so on. So, uh, look, the more we play against them, the better. Uh, get confidence that we get to a national stage. And got a lot of young kids coming through who have had success against New Zealand teams. So. You know, um, but they're not scarred from the past. I think that's important as well. Rins, uh, uh, what the Wallabies, you know, I know, I know it's, uh, there's a lot of uncertainty around, you know, test match rugby and things like that, but what's what's your immediate sort of, uh, I suppose, focus? Is it about winning that Bledisloe Cup back or is this purely a, lo- a long-term game for you? Well, if you, you talk to anyone over there, uh, it's all about the Bledisloe. I think 2002, um, we, we last won one, so... Um, look, look, it's it's not easy to win. Clearly, uh, amazing depth in New Zealand rugby. We're seeing it even uh, post the World Cup, where a lot of guys have left and some real quality coming through. But it's the same in the game in Australia too, I think. And and while there's probably more depth in New Zealand, um, you know, our job is to try and assemble 30 or 40 guys who we think can be really competitive. And so we, we've done a lot of work with Super Rugby sides, um, connecting through the the coaches and so on, and um, uh, they've been great. So they're, they're helping drive some of the things that we think are going to be really important to step up against the All Blacks later in the year. So uh, really appreciate their input so far. We were lucky enough to have your new chairman, uh, Hamish McLennan, on the show. He gave us a bit of insight on the direction he was thinking. What role are you going to play in terms of, I suppose, build, rebuilding some confidence inside the organisation? Yeah, I look, it's so much about belief, I guess, when you when you haven't beaten the All Blacks and it's been the Blues for so long. Um, you know, players lack confidence, I guess. But um, So we're already doing a little bit of work around that. We've, we've done a fair bit of work around culture and working with a small group of players uh, to help drive that once we're, we're all on the camp. Um, the way things will work, we'll, we'll get about maybe three weeks after the final of uh, Super Rugby um, Australia. So... Uh, it's not an enormous amount of time, so we're getting a lot of planning done now. But um, I like, you, you, you've got to have a really positive mindset. We're not going to be the biggest team in world rugby. Um, so there's certain areas that we need to be really good in. And historically, Australian sides have been they've been really smart and played intelligent footy. They've had great skill sets. Um, but they're going to be really important for us. We need to be superbly conditioned. So, um, yeah, like uh, the areas that, areas that we're focusing on now. Dave, you've always been known for doing your research, so I doubt if you wouldn't have done amazing research on taking this job. So what excites you the most? What's the single thing that you think, wow, I'm looking forward to this? Um, well, I mean, we're seventh in the world at the moment. That's um, it's well below where we should be. So um, I just think there's lots of really good people. Uh, a lot of guys are excited. It's... it's you know, so we know it's a big challenge. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we, we reckon we can make some shifts and we're going to have some really good people involved who are working really hard and 
you know, I, I know it's always been a big uh, important thing for me is around work ethic. And so, um, you know, surround yourself with really good people and, and that's what I've done. So uh, just really looking forward to identifying a lot of those good young kids and, and hopefully develop them quickly through Super Rugby and into good uh, test all blacks. And, and uh, obviously there's talk about 2023, but, you know, we need to win now. So, um, you know, I just think uh, we've got to have high expectations and then work hard to achieve it. Friends, uh, Australian rugby's had a policy of bringing guys, vastly experienced guys, back from overseas to play for the national side. Is that going to be something you're going to continue? Are those relationships are really important, bringing back players who can contribute in that environment? And how are you going to deal with that, like you say, when you can't control that work ethic right up front? Yeah, look, um, it's, it's a bit of a slippery slope, Goldie. So, um, but there's certainly some positions where we've lost a lot of guys post World Cup, and we're a bit thin. I reckon the ideal scenario is that we keep picking from Australia, um, encourage players to stay there if they want to be Wallabies. We've got our best players playing there. It'll help develop the good young kids coming through. So, you know, I, I think that's important. It doesn't mean that we won't uh, grab someone from overseas, but it won't be wholesale like uh, South Africa does. Uh, let's talk about the fact Super Rugby Australia has kicked off over the weekend and there's some, been some law adjustments. Uh, what did you make of the first weekend? And, of course, it's hard to tell after only a couple of games, but your first impressions of, one, the games, but also those law changes? Oh, look, it's, it's just great to have footy back. Um, you know, I, I was in the country and... Um, isolation watching those first games here in New Zealand and um, you're fortunate to have massive crowds and you can see the excitement uh, for everyone so uh, been three months since since our boys have played and um, so they've just wrapped to be back out there I know talking to a handful they got pretty sore bodies um, come Sunday morning but um, yeah I, I, I thought it was really positive it's um Again, an opportunity for guys to put pressure on us as selectors, and um, I thought there were some outstanding individual performances. What, did you, what have you made of Super Rugby Aotearoa? The fact that you know your Chiefs, a team that you've taken to a couple of titles, have gone through some tough tussles over the last few weeks. They've been there or thereabouts, but when you look at the contests and what you're going to be up against, what's your impressions of that? Yeah, I look, I, I think um, you know, the competition's developing in it. Um, I think the Australian comps had the advantage of sitting back three weeks and watching. Um, so when you look at the penalty count, while well, round one uh, was pretty similar to round one in Aotearoa competition, uh, there were a lot more penalties at scrum time in our round. And uh, I thought the breakdown was probably handled a little bit better. And we've seen a massive change even in the Aotearoa game where um, there are a lot more penalties against the defensive side in the last round compared to what we saw in round one. So I think the referees have got a better handle on it. And um, like I said, I think our referees had the benefit of sitting back and watching. Um, it's been an enormous amount of kicking, Goldie. Um, so that's, that's one stat that was a lot higher. I think 47 kicks per, per game versus 36. And, um, and then uh, ball and play. Um, Kiwi sides are great at keeping the ball alive and, and playing, so there's about four or five more minutes of uh, playing time, which is significant. But you, know, you look at uh, playing in Canberra, seven o'clock in the middle of winter, uh, not an easy place to play. <laughs> you, you said it, but you're going to be spending plenty of time there, mate. <laughs> so get used to it, get on the plane, get on the bus, get down and check it out. Mate, we know that you're going to have this uh, Wallaby team humming. Thanks very much for joining us. Stay safe, travel safe, and we look forward to seeing you on the sidelines. Thanks for joining us, mate. Yes, guys. Look, uh, of looks course, well, the eh? Rebels and Reds. Looks well, and, eh? Oh, look, he knows oh, what mate. he's getting into. The fact, and, and we shouldn't forget it's on. It's uh, live rugby coming out of Australia, it's... On Friday night, it's on Saturday following our games here, both at 9 o'clock. So I'm excited to see where he can get them to because he talks about he's got to win now, Mills. Yeah. That's not easy, but also the fact that he doesn't seem that keen to bring too many guys back. No. He, he wants the guys, and that to me looks as though he's, he's also thinking long-term. Yeah, he definitely is. And you, you've seen what he's done with the Chiefs, you know, when he, when he won those titles and what he built, and you hear him say that, you know, being around good people, people that work hard. 
So the culture needs to change, you know. So well, I think that's the first the first thing we're looking to try and do: change that culture, get belief back into the to the um, to the Wallabies, because that's what they've lacked over the years. And so a lot of that's coming out from him, and it's what he took to the Chiefs. Do you reckon the Australian team has been underachieving? I think I reckon he thinks they have. Oh, he said it because he said seventh. Mm. You know, I, I think that he he believes with a bit of culture. And culture means you can't let your players come in from overseas, I don't reckon, Mills, right? So I think that he sees... He would have, he studied it for a year. I mean, he hasn't taken this lightly. He's a smart man. He's got a few tricks up his sleeve. I didn't know whether to wish him good luck or not. I want him good luck because I want a contest. I want a contest. He's a game-changer. But not a lot of luck. He's like, a game-changer. but not heaps of For Australian rugby. Throughout Super Rugby, Aotearoa, we're bringing you the two degrees game-changer. Each week, we will show you two key moments from the weekend. You can win... 12 months of Two Degrees Mobile and Broadband, a Samsung phone plus a field replica Super Rugby jersey from your favourite team. Let's have a look at the Two Degrees game changers from the weekend. Oh, they've got their tails up here as well. A bit of confidence. But this is a huge kick. Look at that. Whoa. Geordie Barrett, 58 metres out. And away it goes. Distance is not an issue. What a kick that is. Jordy Barrett lands a mammoth penalty goal. Head to facebook.com forward slash two degrees to vote. We'll name the winner in the build-up to the Crusaders and Blues match on Saturday. Two big moments from the weekend. A fantastic kick. We've talked about that. Jonah Nareki will be ruining missed opportunities. But I, I look at the weekend and I... We That's when you want a spade, eh? Yeah. <laughs> We've all been there. <laughs> the 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 skills with Mills would never have happened, right? And the only time you dummy when you're that close to the line is when you want to score a try. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and you make a move on it, right? <laughs> yeah. You make a move on it. And in the context of the game, it was right there for the Highlanders to put some pressure on the Crusaders. But if you look at I look at the contest and, and the yellow cards and the opportunities the Chiefs had, and they missed out on the weekend, JK... Yeah, I mean, 30 minutes without, uh, you know, down to player, 14, 14 now, I men. I mean, I thought that, I think that we need to take a look at that because uh, Scrafton got yellow carded as a team and the second one was a personal. I mean, should that be a red? Should it just be another yellow? Because it's pretty harsh considering no foul play and he didn't do anything. But getting back to your point, you know, the Chiefs, and they scored, Mills. Mm. The, the Hurricanes scored with, with 14 men. So... You know, I thought the yellow card was harsh. Uh, the red card was harsh. It should have been yellow. The second one. But I on the other side of things, though, Mills, um, the Hurricanes' defence yeah. was outstanding. This is a, a Chiefs team which has got some serious attacking ability, the likes of Damian McKenzie and Aaron Cruden taking to the line. They did not give an inch. No, and they, they shut them down, didn't they? They almost came like uh, from an outside in just to show their faces a little bit. They, they're like... The Chiefs are at their best when they get front foot ball. They're offloading, you know, when it gets a little bit scrappy. The thing was with the Chiefs, they weren't going forward. You know, there's, they showed plenty of heart in this situation here, you know, getting over the over as well. They, they stopped the try, but also guys stepping up, like Artie Savier. You know, I was, I was thinking when I was watching it, you know, thinking, man, where, where is he? And then all of a sudden, big moments. Here's a big moment here that he's won, a big moment where he's, he's sort of ran with the ball. So all those guys stepped up at the right times. The, the Chiefs just don't seem to be getting that momentum. Well, the Hurricanes can sneak their way back into this competition, but the Highlanders aren't out of it either. You think about this contest context on Sunday between those two sides. Yes, everyone's talking Blues and Crusaders. We know that's big, JK. But for both of those other teams to get some momentum, they have been right there. Yeah, and look, I, th I think the interesting thing for me is this current competition is the closest thing you're going to get to a Test match. So you cannot not take those opportunities. So the interesting thing for me on Sunday will be it, they're coming down to moments. Now, people say, oh, yeah, but, it, but a moment, and you'll know this, guys, a moment in the first half when you don't score that try can be just as important as a moment late in the second half. So you've got to take your moments. And right now, I think the Highlanders and the Chiefs are just not taking them as well as the other teams. Up until um, the weekend, I thought the Hurricanes were 
a little off their game, but the defence brought them straight back into it. So they're going to be tough. And that's always a reflection of attitude. Now, we've got to remember that they have lost a coach. Mm. Carlos Spencer has moved out of the environment. And whether or not, like I say, maybe they're able to refocus, get a little bit more direction and, and take more responsibility themselves for their own performance, I think that's pretty critical. The other side of it for me is the Chiefs. Here's a team pre-COVID playing really well, yeah. playing really good rugby. And then all of a sudden, there's been some adjustments in regards to how the law's being applied. Where's it not quite working for them right now? Yeah, I just think with the way the competition is run as well, they, they lost that first game. They didn't play as well as what perhaps they, sh they should have. And then the, the confidence has slowly dropped. They've got a young bunch. Let's not forget that, you know, a group of young, of young men. And then all of a sudden they lose Anton Leonard Brown. How significant was him, you know, pulling out in that last sort of moment? They, they, and, and in the engine room too, where it's really important, they need those big men, like a Brody Rotalic, and that's stepping up. And so you're absolutely right, you know, they're, they're humming along, they've come a little bit unstuck, and now it almost seems like you know, they're forcing. Renz is talking about more kicks in the game. Does that suit them? Yeah, well, I think the Chiefs are too predictable in the ball carrying. I don't think there's enough going on around the ball carry, especially when they're close to the ruck. I think they haven't got quite the mix between kick and counter-attack. The Chiefs were always one of the best counter-attackers. And the third thing is I think they've got, you know, young second row and their, their line-out, their, one of their la launch mechanisms being taken away from them. Plus, they've blown, probably in the last few weeks, four decent try-scoring opportunities. You can't win football like that. Some guys playing really well though, and we're going to talk about the fullbacks later on when we talk uh, in spotlight. But I look at Jordy Barrett; he came back into this game. He knows how to play, but we're still debating where his best position is and the impact he having the game. But when you can knock him over for 58 metres, Mills, the sort of influence that can have on a team in terms of all of a sudden the opposition can't afford to give away penalties, and we've seen a number of those in this competition. I just like what some of them are doing. Dane Coles seems to re rejuvenate it after the break. Oh, I like the. I like. His mindset, this is Geordie Barrett when he came back, we came in. His first touch of the ball, he didn't he didn't do anything but run straight. He wanted to get in you know, a little bit of contact, get a little bit of confidence. And, and then as the game progressed, he caught a few balls on the floor, wasn't letting it bounce. He just grew in confidence. And then when you do something like this just before the break, you know, I mean, what, what does that do to, to the rest of your team? Here's a guy that's been out for a very long time. He's coming back, he's playing some good footy all around, and then he knocks a uh, uh, a penalty 58 metres out. Even, all of a sudden, everyone else lifts. You know? and, and what that does to the opposition, JK, as well. Yeah, well, we heard from Barnes at half time. <laughs> what a team wasn't <laughs> happy about it at all. <laughs> but the thing that surprised me the most is even, even Bowden, after his break, come back and sort of eased into it. But I thought Geordie came back and flew into it. He was just excited about it. That's a pretty good performance at this level in a tournament like this when you haven't played for a while. Yeah, well, the Chiefs, they get a week off now. But we have tickets, as we do every week, for each game to give away. The Blues and Crusaders, that is down in Christchurch. And, of course, the other game, it's the Hurricanes and the Highlanders. That is it. Sky Stadium in Wellington. Win a double pass to both of those games. Go to the breakdown at sky.co.nz. Yes, well, Super Rugby Aotearoa is in action. All the squads are together for the first time in 2020. In preparation for a couple of proposed test matches at this stage, proposed, I'll say that clearly, against the Wallaroos, the Black Ferns are back in camp. You know, it's been particularly good for us to get everyone back in into, um, into a camp format and, and get some of the stuff that we'd started introducing in January and February going again. And, you know, we've probably had to push the reset button with it and just assume that, you know, we're starting from scratch again. Focusing on staying ready for whatever comes. Um, with the FPC being confirmed now, that's awesome. We know we've got that platform, that next step up. And then just keeping game ready and um, hopefully we get some tests against Australia at the end of the year. The NZA, you are working hard on, you know, establishing some fixtures. And, you know, Aussie is obviously one that might be a little bit easier to facilitate. Definitely, if they can come across, I'm, I'm sure we'll have them here in a heartbeat. Like if there's a double header, you know, ramp it up again, get the, get the uh, supporters there and everything. So definitely an option. After this, in a couple of weeks, we're doing a regional one. The middle of the North Island up, we'll assemble here, and then we'll do a follow-up in August with the Central North Island, South Island down in Christchurch. And, you know, it's, it's been really good this weekend. It's, it's been exciting for us uh, being able to work with the players and not, not doing it over Zoom. And, um, yeah, it, it certainly felt different.
Hewitt breakdown, and you know we're going to talk about it. We have to talk about it. With all the rah-rah and hoopla of Bowden Barrett signing with the Blues, we now know that he also signed with Suntory in Japan. Well, the Auckland outfit will be sans their star signing next year, but only for a season. Bodie's back for the Blues in 2022. Seems like a long way off, though, doesn't it? He's the ultimate nomad, our Bodie. The Hurricanes to the Blues to Japan, where he's rumoured to be pocketing cool one and a half million big ones. Well, Bodie's yet to front on the matter, though. His brother Geordie was left to field questions during his press conference for the Hurricanes on Friday. He said Bodie was a little bit busy playing golf, so he'd take the hit for him. Um, it's probably well played on his behalf. He's enjoying playing golf in Queenstown while I have to front and do his media, so, um, yeah. Well played, Bowden. Yeah. Brotherly love, eh? So, who is this good for? He clearly had the sign-off from the Blues, but are they really happy? Are the fans happy? What have they got? Have they got what they wanted? What was it? A playmaker utility back or a star in camp to G up the troops and get Aucklanders to reignite their love affair with rugby? Well, Leon McDonald's admitted that he'll be a big loss, but that's counted with what he's doing on and off the field this year and that we get him back for two more years. So there you go, it's all those things. And guess who's behind it? The director of rugby at Suntory, Eddie Jones. 2020, it just gets better and better, doesn't it? Question. Was Bodie, is Bodie value for money? Does New Zealand rugby or the game globally gain by this? And if Bodie can do it, who's next? Now, you don't deny the players are living and furthering their career, and he's certainly not alone. Think Brady Retallick, think Sam Whitelock, Dan Carter. But it again raises some questions, doesn't it? Bodie, off to Japan. Rate it or hate it? And that is the massive debate we're going to have here. And, and this is part of a bigger picture. This is part of the fact that what is the model for contracting of players going forward? We know things have changed. The market Mills globally is different. But Mills isn't... Uh, but he's not the first person to do this. There are a number of players that done it. And you can't argue with the logic behind it. No, you certainly can't. And when you look at it, I mean, guys have done it. They haven't done it for as long. And the, certainly the money hasn't been... Um, you know, as big. I think when they look at it, it's it's a four-year cycle. So he's, he's obviously he's come back, and what they do, uh, you know, and the agents in this in this occasion, Halo Sport, you know, they look at it in four years. He's wanted to stay in New Zealand. He's come out and said that, but you're not going to compete with the money that he's getting offered to, to, to move offshore. So in order to capitalise on that, you know, he's obviously come into the Blues, and then he goes um, away for a year, and he still doesn't make the money that he's going to be offered overseas. And then he comes back for another two years and, uh, and finishes off his contract. The alternative to that is he goes. OK, he goes for that four years and we don't, we don't see him again. And I think that's where you, you lose him. You know, you look at the guys like Satutu and Talia who's just signed. And what he brings, I think those guys are the important guys. Those are the guys that you want to stay here. When we start losing guys like that nice and early, then we're in a bit of trouble. Look, I, I think let's put the name Bowden Barrett to one side. Forget about that. All the players need to do it because our game cannot sustain our players playing in New Zealand for the competition money in the Northern Hemisphere. So, so my argument is, what are we going to do in New Zealand to start giving the franchises or we need to earn more money to keep them? If they go on a... This is a financial sabbatical, right? If they go on a sabbatical because they want to have an experience overseas, I get that. But at the end of the day, what do we need to do? Private equity? private ownership. I mean, Saprit Singh, Bayern Munich gave the Phoenix $1 million as a transfer fee. I mean, are we really professional? Should we be having transfer fees? We need to start thinking about things a wee bit differently because poor old Bowden's going to get it from some part of the public. We all understand it, but people say, oh, he's just got to the Blues and now he's left. But we have to do this to keep our top players. So what do we need to do as a game right now when there's massive change going on to see what we can do to keep him. Is it ownership of the Blues Mills where an owner comes in and he can afford to keep him? But that owner needs some exposure to make money out of a franchise and that's not happening at the moment. There are two different sides to this. There's private ownership and then there is obviously private equity coming into a game. And they, they are two very different things. And private ownership is when you've got locals, you've got businessmen, you've got individuals mills that are going to come into organisation and they're going to want to invest. But at the moment, we have centralised contracting. Everything is done through New Zealand. And it has led us to win and helped us win a couple of World Cups. But 
Has that model's time passed? Is it time for us to explore other opportunities to try and bring the revenue you're talking about to maybe not have a... And these are guys who left a few years ago, Charles Piatel, Stephen Luatua, who didn't get sabbaticals, they just left. Can we find the revenue to keep everyone here, or is that unrealistic? Well, I think that's what they've got to find. Do we, do we, do we have the confidence to be able to do that? On the same token, you give you know, a, a business you know, something and, and ownership, they're, they're going to want everything out of you. So, we, I mean, our biggest asset has been, you know, we don't play as many games overseas as what they do overseas. They play 30 or 40-odd games, you know, a year. And so if, you, if I'm going to invest money into it, if I'm going to buy a, a, uh, a franchise, I want these guys playing week in, week out. I don't want them playing 10 games a year. And, but, I, don't, and, I, and, and I think that's where they, want, they wouldn't get that money back, you know. If you're only going to play 10 games a year, how, how, how long would it be until that sort of goes stale? Yeah, look, I think Mark Roberts has already said New Zealand open to all options but believes central contracting with the players is still the best option, right? Now, the thing is, what you're talking about, Bill, is for me, if you are going to give the franchises some freedom, they also have to have some of the pie. So we have to create competition where they're getting some of the television revenue, some of the sponsors that we By central contracting, all the money's got to go to the New Zealand Rugby Union and then be distributed out. Is that model need to be looked at? Because if you're an owner... And I think, look, the Blues really messed it up with Murray Bolton. He was in for the long run. There was a bit of conflict. They couldn't get on. And so they missed an opportunity because that was our first chance at it. Mm. But an owner is going to want something out of it, and it's going to be a return. You can't get in. I mean, the other guys you talk about, Goldie, and there's guys in Wellington who are giving some... They're just donating. You know, they're just great citizens that love our game. But a real investment means I'm in this for the long term, but at the end of the day, I want to be like the Americans and sell the franchise. If I bought it for $10 million, I want to sell it for 40 And the only way you're going to get that is that isn't that where private equity comes into is the fact that someone buys a competition, which we've seen in the Northern Hemisphere, which has happened. You've had people come in and pay for a percentage of a competition and then go on to sell the rights uh, in and around it. Talk about this and you're going, is that, the, is that where you are going to get the sort of revenue you're talking about? But what are the risks with that, Mills? Well, what is the risk exactly. when all of a sudden, when you have somebody else in control of a competition that has our players a part of it? I'll tell you what, the risk is what, what's happening over in, in, in the Northern Hemisphere where they, they want to go and play uh, a test match down and down against us, but your clubs won't release it. Why, why would I then want to release my players after the season's just finished and then go down and play four matches down in New Zealand and then come back and then start a pre-season game where they could possibly get injured? That is where the risk comes. And now, do we, do, does New Zealand rugby have the confidence? Well, then that's, that's in their, their it's the, the ball's in their court. But that's where I, th I feel that you're going to get. You're, you're going to have a real, something that's, going to, that's, that's happening over in the Northern Hemisphere where the owners own everything. And they own the rights. So are we, are we letting go of the All Blacks? Is that, is that what we're saying here? That's, well, that's a risk you take. Th there's also another option, Mills, and this is why I'm so adamant that the competition needs to change now. Because if we have the Japanese competition on our doorstep with 25 major companies spending $28 million a year on their rugby programme and Bowden goes over there but he's coming down to play the Blues in a competition and he's playing well enough, why wouldn't we say, OK, we'll start picking the All Blacks from a competition that is within our region. Our trouble is, is that our region is our opposition, Australia and South Africa. But if we married Japan and said, we want to use that money that's over there, and if Bowden's playing well enough to play there, and Piatau and Luatua, bring it on. Is one of the challenges the fact that because of the central contracting model, which South Africa, Australia, teams that have won Rugby World Cups recently, <laughs> most of them, in fact, all of them since 2003, in terms of performance, you look at that and you're going, if you... Is all of the focus on the top end, on the All Blacks, is that dangerous and is that why sometimes we do lose that tier of player? The fact Because you can't reward them the way they probably should be rewarded at Super Rugby level because their income is pretty much capped. They can sort of get to a couple of hundred thousand dollars and then that is it. Now I know that's a lot of money but rugby's career is not that long. Uh, maybe we, is there too much focus on the top tier of players' mills. The fact that is there too much investment and do we have to back ourselves to get depth and to create talent? Well, we have, we've got depth, you know, we've got plenty of talent and you, you're absolutely right. That second, third tier where you can only get limited money and, and also to extend, well, that's why, you know, Bowden's gone overseas. We have focused on that top end and why? Because it's our biggest money earner. You go overseas and the all black brand and what that provide is our biggest money earner. So, why can we actually use that and say, well, we're not going to tour. If we're going to go in private um, privatisation, 
well, why don't we use that as a, as a weapon? Say, well, we're not going to tour as, in, as an all-black. If we get all the owners involved, we won't tour unless we're going to get 50, 60% of the, of the, um, the, of the gates. gates. And that's the way that we could possibly go ahead and, and, and get some monetary. Back, back to your argument, Goldie. In football, 20% of the players get 80% of the money. So the top players getting a majority of the money is no different all around the world. The problem, I believe, in our is our pool's not big enough to keep the top guys and some of those guys that would like to keep for our competition. And that is just a revenue issue, right? So if we do private ownership, then we have to have a pathway to other competitions. If you, like, for example, when you're coaching in Europe and your team, and you would have seen this when you're in Italy, Mills, if Calvazano make the, the European Cup, they get a million euro. Mm to contribute, but it goes to the club. Now, it goes by the union and they take a little clip. <laughs> <laughs> they don't keep the whole lot. Oh, that could be all right. Oh, that could but it's all right. That but that's work. what I'm saying. If we're going to create a competition where our franchises have a pathway, it also has to, they have to get part of the broadcasting deal, the sponsorship deals, and that's where it gets complicated because you would lose a little bit of power over your players. Well, what you but I'd, what I'd like to see, just to finish, sorry, yeah, Goldie, no. is that the, the franchises have the financial ability to keep Bowden with paying him the equivalent that he'd get to go in Japan. That'd be great. And that, but that costs, and that costs significantly. And they are, all of a sudden, the negotiations and the revenue opportunities a club would need, Mills, all of a sudden, the club itself, it would have the, have to be the opportunity to negotiate and find revenue and bring it all together. And that in itself, do we believe it's there? Because we don't want to go down that path where all of a sudden we've lost opportunities. And in saying that... I, one major revenue, you're talking about the All Blacks, could that not turn into six if you had five working behind the scenes, five major franchises working and generating their own income? Does that not support the players' revenue? Well, it could. And I suppose the next question is, have we got that? Have, is there ability, and that's probably what the, the, the uncertainty about the rugby union is, is there enough people that are willing to actually back an individual team, our five, you know, our five franchise, and 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 be big, because that's that's realistically what what's got to happen. Someone has got to come in. And I is, think there's is a there, market overseas for, no, the, 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 for the, the, the problem. The problem is in France, right? So what happened in France is they just signed the biggest television deal in the history of the game, but it was for the owners, right? Because they signed the deal for that particular competition. The downside of that is England's had the greatest football competition for the last. 30 years, but they haven't won a World Cup. France rugby, two years ago when I was over there, one of their elders was saying, we do not have a Frenchman playing number eight or number 10, right? So the other risks you're, you're going to take. So is this Bowden decision, no, we're losing for a year, but hey, actually we're OK? Or do we need to really push the game right now that we've got the opportunity? I look at it... I these are d difficult conversations, but we're talking these conversations now, Mills, are the ones that are going to shape the game for the next 10, 20, 30 years in regards to what it looks like. And Dave Rennie's already talked about the fact that he sees Australia and New Zealand needing to come yeah. together. It looks as though that they're finding a way to bring... Uh, uh, JK is using no, no, screwing up his face. Hang on a minute. Like, I'm screwing my face up, and, and I'm screwing my face up for two reasons. Do we have any power on world rugby? Secondly, I love our Australian brothers and sisters, but who needs who? If you play rugby Aotearoa and actually play it every second week, give the boys a rest because they're so hard, would that set us up to be the greatest, you know? And I think we need to support people, but where do we stop? Well, we were It'd be close. a little bit more... Actually, we're in trouble here. We were close to Bill Beaumont this week, JK. Really close. We got within another email of him. And all of a no sudden, way. We got Did within one more email and we got, yes, we'll see you next week. Uncle so Bill, I'm waiting for you, days, Uncle Bill. Seven days away. Uncle Bill, I'm waiting. i tell you what, some challenges in front, but understand where Bowden Barrett is heading to right now. We have got tickets to give away to both games this weekend. It's the Crusaders taking on the Blues and it's the Hurricanes taking on the Highlanders. Go to the breakdown at sky.co.nz to win those tickets. Well, from one fantastic first five to another, maybe on in senior years. Yes, he may have signed for the Blues, but... Dan Carter, he returned down south and went back to Southbridge for a match on the weekend. Coming back and seeing familiar faces, uh, familiar surroundings, obviously a lot of childhood memories uh, playing here at the club, so um, yeah, don't get out 
here that often, so when I do, it's always pretty pretty special. Every time I, I do get to, to come back and, and put on the blue and white hoops, I absolutely love it. And today was uh, was another one of those special days, just to see uh, the kids, both uh, Southbridge, Leaston, West Melton. You know, kids from all around the district is coming out and, and supporting uh, club rugby, and, and that's what it's all about, to have a, a packed out club rooms. Oh, I absolutely love it. Oh, it's a pretty special moment to, to join uh, a list of, of life members at uh, a club that that means uh, a lot to me and my family. So, yeah, thank you, and yeah, everyone, have a toast. Cheers. Welcome back to the breakdown. What a board that is. Look at that. The spotlight is on. Fullbacks. Five wonderful fullbacks and the all black fullback right in the middle. It's wrong. But, what do you mean it's wrong? You can't have you him can't. up there. He's, he's normally wearing black and he's in 15 there. The, the middle is about Barrett. Okay, uh, Mills, has this uh, first five playing fullback, fullback playing first five worked? Do you, Are you do still you on that? I don't think so. I, I think you specialise. You specialise in 10 and I think, I'm with you, JK, I think he's a 10. Bodie's a 10, and we look and we focus on the other four. He's been the best number 10 in the world for a couple of years. So why is he at fullback? Didn't hear you talking about it last year. It's a, it's a convenient now. I mean, let's be honest, though. I'm talking about the wall. I'm talking about the fact Damien McKenzie, David Harvelli. You're talking about we've got North versus South coming up. We've got these guys going head to head. The sort of talent we're talking there, Bodie Barrett, Geordie Barrett, David Harvelli, JK. These are conversations. If you're Ian Foster, Grant Fox and a selection panel, you're looking at two va well, a number of vastly talented players. I mean, have we ever had that much depth in one single position? Oh, every year, Goldie. That's why we can let Bodie go, actually because I reckon the whole board up there are outstanding. And when you look at two of them, like we spoke, spoke about before, you know, Damien last year played 10 for half the season. So, I mean, and the younger guys coming through, I reckon what, what I'd like to see of Geordie, though, is I reckon he's outstanding at fullback. I think he's got height. I think he's got a long kick, which gives you two kickers on the field. I reckon he's our next 15. I love his confidence go. in the position. I mean, you see some of these distribution skills. I mean, yes, we know his kicking, but he had a fantastic offload to help him score on the outside. I mean, the skill set's all there. Yeah. I mean, have you got a preference for him, Mills? I, I think it's nice when he's, he's that young. He's got a bit of freedom and, and uh, you know, skill set. He's been able to express himself. He gets out there. He gets a bit, bit more time with the ball in hand as well. And, and because he's so tall, it's good for the ball in the air. I, I, I reckon he'll end up in the midfield, Chris, and that's the skill set that he's got. I like the way I like. Yeah, we're not short on midfielders either. No, no. I saw him for Francis Douglas at twelve horse. Yeah. Oh, okay. What about Will Jordan? We're talking about a guy who's a breakout player, Super Rugby, Aotearoa already. Look, number of seasons where he's just picked up a couple of niggles. Crusaders have got incredible depth, but I think Mills we're seeing a different player. Talented. this year. Yeah, very talented. I mean, and he's had a couple of injuries as well, so he's come back <laughs> well from him. But the thing is, confidence again. What I love about uh, about all these players is that they create from from nothing. The meters that they've got. 300 old plus over uh, old Teodoro, Super Rugby Old Teodoro. But they're harder. So, what we've done, JK. Yeah, no, you know what, what I'm laughing, done? though? Why? Why have you got two Crusaders? They can't even decide who's their best fullback. Yeah, well, David Harvelli. Now, here's the funny thing. If I had to put together a back line, I'd find it really hard not to put David Harvelli in that back line. The fact that the first part of Super Rugby this year, outstanding, and what I've seen since the comeback, think about the injury he had. So, you're dropping Jordan. What's that? I'm on dropping Will Jordan. I'm, I'm taking David Harvelli, first and foremost. Here's the thing. You know what we do? We do it really well as we put a nice, talented fullback. We put him on the wing. That's what you can do with Will Jordan because you, you, you blood him that way. Did it with Ben Smith. You give them their opportunity. But for me, David Harvelli. You can't right have now. that conversation here because, because we're not oh, talking you about You always winners. move people around. No, but we're not talking you about that. We're not talking about that now because like... who are you going to leave out on the wing? What's that? Who are you going to leave out on the That's wing That's a different right conversation. I didn't go into that. Look, yeah, but so we, we've got to pick your fullback. That's what I'm saying. And I'm yeah. going Geordie. And I'm going David Harvelli. I'll have to say Harvelli in this situation as well. I think... Well, and he's done enough to, be, to merit that. Well, we're going to see three of these guys. We're going to see three of these guys on the weekend, gentlemen. Will Jordan? Well, thought, who we, knows? Raise them, who could well, raise a pick? We don't know who's play, going to pick. So you say in the Blues. Are we picking our north-south fullbacks? That what you're telling no, me? No, we're not, we're not picking that. We're talking about the guys who are in form. I'm talking about oh. possible all-back fullbacks. I want you to talk about who's going to have the impact on the weekend and the big game. Because you're going down there, your blue shoes are on, so you've got no doubts, but how are you going to win? We've got Bodie. Oh, another. you've got Bodie, that's it. <laughs> that's the whole thing. And for so another three so, months. Okay, so how does that mean for you? 
Oh, gee, I just I can't pick it. I honestly, I mean, I, I think home home yep. advantage is seven points, so it's it's going to have to be the Crusaders. Bernie, come in and tell us who's actually going to win this game, will you? Oh, I'm going to be impartial. I just reckon, oh, you're not. I reckon put Will Jordan um, propping because I reckon he can do anything. He's a star. That's my take on it. Uh, look, he might like to put the boot in when he's on the field, but Bone Barrett, he's making good use of his boots off the field, auctioning his kickers for charity. Now, proceeds from the boots he wore at the 2019 Rugby World Cup, they'll go to the Taranaki Down Syndrome Association. Now, Barrett's teenage sister, Zara, has down. So, Zara, remind your big brother that Dan Carter's all-black jersey, it sold for $21,000, so no pressure, Bodie. Bodie's in action in Christchurch this weekend. The Blues, they travel south to meet the Crusaders, 6.30 live on Sky. Both teams are unbeaten. They're delivering every week. It will be a huge match. Sunday, the Canes host the Landers. That match live from three. And if you would like tickets to that, hit us up. Easy as that, an email at thebreakdown.co.nz. And we've got a great email from Chopper. He won tickets last week from the Chiefs Hurricanes. He's a Hurricanes fan. He'll be happy, man. Chopper, you're breaking my heart. But glad you enjoyed the game, and thanks for the email. Chopper. How good's that? Fantastic. I tell you what, it's been fun tonight. It's been great. I'm looking forward to seeing you down in Christchurch. We're going to down there, Orange Theory Stadium. I'll tell you what, what you come out, give JK, Sir John Cohen, a big welcome. Thanks, Mills. Thanks, Bernie. Thanks, JK. We'll see you on the weekend. We'll see you on the breakdown next Tuesday night. Can't hold us down. No. Can't hold us down